Dave Talks Comics, Episode 52. What I Bought, Wolverine, Young Justice. Dave Talks Comics is a podcast on the subjects of comic books and cartoons. I talk about comics I have read and cartoons I have watched. Dave Talks Comics can be found on the web at davetalkscomics.com and at facebook.com slash davetalkscomics. On Twitter, you can find me at davetalkscomics. Email can be sent to dave at davetalkscomics or... Dave Talks Comics at gmail.com. I talk for my notes on these comics and cartoons. I don't go panel by panel. I try to do more than just summarize the stories. This podcast is not spoiler free. I try not to spoil everything, but in the process of talking about these comics and cartoons, I may spoil them in some way. On this episode, I will be talking about a couple of recent purchases, speculative relationships, and the Lou Fine Treasury. I will also be talking about a Wolverine story called Claws and Webs, which originally appeared in Marvel Comics Presents. And I will be talking about the, uh, the 16th episode of the first season of Young Justice. What I bought. I got home yesterday to find a couple packages waiting for me. Not oh, Just one book in each package, not a lot of stuff. One of these I got through eBay. The other one was a Kickstarter reward. I think I'll start with the Kickstarter reward. The eBay item is... Well, it's a book that was, well, it's over 20, okay, let me start with the Kickstarter book. Kickstarter book is Speculative Relationships, a science fiction romance comics anthology. This is, uh, as the title implies, well, the title says it all, I think, or the subtitle, a science fiction comics, a science fiction romance comics anthology. And I kind of bypassed this when I first saw it on Kickstarter, because I, I get these, Kickstarter has an RSS feed and that, that I subscribe to, so I get tons of Kickstarter projects. I don't think it's all Kickstarters, but there's probably at least 10 or 20 a day uh, that that I get uh, that show up in my, my what, which, is it Feedly? And then Feedly is where is the, but what do I, I use Byline, I think, or Byline's on my, on my iPhone. What do I use on? Oh, I use Pro Reader on my tablet. And yes, G Reader, G Reader Pro. Yeah, I paid for it, so I don't have to see the ads. That's right. Okay. Anyway, off of that tangent, back to the book. So I wasn't originally going to get this, but then I saw that, and I may have known this already, but I saw the art that Daniel Warren Johnson had done for his story. And I know of him because he does the webcomic called Space Mullet. I think that's what it's called, Space Mullet. And and uh, I, I knew that he was doing a story for it, but the art really looked beautiful. And I think I paid $15 for this, and this is a hard copy of it. I don't know if this is going to be sold other than th- the hard copy, other than through the Kickstarter, although it does have an ISBN code on the back, so I tend to think it would be. I'm sure it's available through, or it should be available through Comixology. I'm not certain if it's been released or if it's only available as of right now to to the Kickstarter backers. But it looks like a gorgeous book. It's only like 5 by 8 And uh, the, stories are, the stories are all short. It's probably not more than 100 pages in total. 
I think the shortest one I saw was four pages and probably there's no more than longer than about ten pages. And these are all kind of, you know, science fiction, weird romances between humans and aliens and robots and who knows what else. But uh, it, it really looks cool. So I'm looking forward to reading this. I've only flipped through it at this point. And the stories are by Tyrell Cannon, Rinko Endo, Daniel Warren Johnson, Scott Kroll, Michael Manomivable, not sure if I pronounced that correctly, and Isabella Rotman. Okay, so that's Speculative Relationships. That was the book I got through Kickstarter. And then the book that I got through eBay, this was something I've been wanting for a long time, or at least I've been wanting some art, some stories, to read some stories by this creator. And that creator is Lou Fine. And, there, of course, he, he was a Golden Age creator. I knew him best for having drawn... I would see reprints of pages he had drawn for of Uncle Sam, as in the character from originally Quality Comics, later DC Comics. Uh, he was the leader of the Freedom Fighters. If you've read the All-Star Squadron, especially issues, I think it's 30 through 35, he shows up in there, and uh, that kind of retells or tells the origin of the Freedom Fighters, although the Freedom Fighters, uh, well, they originally appeared individually back in the 40s in in various books, and then in the 70s, they appeared in a Justice League of America story in which, which was the first appearance, really, of the, of them as a team and of Earth, what became to be called Earth X, which was the world where the Nazis won World War II. And the Freedom Fighters were the only heroes that were there. I have, I think, one of those issues. I think it was a two- or three-parter. I think like 107 and 108 or something like that. I have one of those. I really should go back and reread that story. And then I have like the first eight issues of the Freedom Fighters run. They they had their own series back in the mid seventies, but I think it ran for about sixteen or seventeen issues altogether. So th- this is a collection of this was printed by Pure Imagination Publications. It was printed in nineteen ninety one. It's reprinting stories from the nineteen forties. There is an Uncle Sam story in here. There is a a story of the Ray, another character who was part of the Freedom Fighters. There's, a, I think, two stories of the Black Condor, another member of the Freedom Fighters, plus a few other stories. And Uncle Sam, the Ray, the Black Condor. Oh, also the Doll Man, another member of the Freedom Fighters. There's a character named Hack O'Hara, Stormy Foster... Let's see, The Flame, Wilton of the West, those characters were not members of the Freedom Fighters, but they were all drawn by, uh, all the stories in here were drawn by Lou Fine. And he he had a really clean, I mean, his name is appropriate, I don't know, maybe it was a a pen name, but his, his name is appropriate because he had a very fine line. It wasn't as, I don't know, some of the Golden Age art that I see seems rather, uh... Clumpy, I don't know. It's, I'm not being fair here, but it's it's just it's it's not very. It, I, I suppose the comic art was still in its early days at that point. Although there certainly had been comic strips around for a long time, but I find some of that golden age art to be very unappealing, and I I can't say that about about Lou Fine. I mean, his stuff like something like. Uh, um, oh God! The guy who did Terry and the Pirates and Steve Canyon—I'm drawing a blank on his name. Milton Kniff, but like Milton Kniff's work, like Hal Foster's work, like Alex Raymond's work. Hal Foster's the one who drew Prince Valiant. Uh, Alex Raymond drew the old Flash Gordon comic strip. I mean, the, I think that Lou Fine's work is is in that same sort of mold, or even old Will Eisner work, or Jack Cole's another Golden Age artist whose work I really liked. Uh, I, I, I mean, they, they all had their good days and their bad days, um, 
they weren't all perfect, but this stuff is really good. So anyway, this has it has a number of stories. It's about two hundred pages, I guess, something like that. It has an introduction, which is written by let's see if I can find out a name in here by Greg Theakston. Um, and let's see, these stories were all were all from nineteen thirty nine to nineteen forty one. Let's see. So I'm looking forward to reading this. I mean, it, it really looks like it should be a good read. And, and I got it for, it, the cover price was $20, 1995 And I picked it up for, I think, $12, including shipping off of eBay. So I really got lucky. It's not in perfect shape, but it's in very nice shape. You know, a couple of dings. But other than that, and a little faded. On the uh, the covers, a little teensy bit faded, a little smudged in a couple places, you know. Um, so it's not in perfect shape, but I'd say very fine, and that seems like a great price. If you can find it for a decent price, and you may have to pay cover price or even a little more, I would not pay extreme amount more. But if you're interested in Golden Age art, if you're interested in the Freedom Fighters, I would, I'd think that this would be something you'd want to own. So that's it for what I bought. Uh, a few more comments about the the Lou Fine Treasury. I mentioned the Freedom Fighters, and I just wanted to provide a little more background on them. They, to clarify, they did their first appearances were in, well, their first appearances as a team was in Justice League of America issues 107 and 108 when during a JSA-JLA team-up, the members of both teams wound up on Earth-X, which this is all, of course, this which this which these issues appeared and came out in 1973. And at that time, Earth-X was the Earth where the Nazis had won the war. And all of these characters that appeared that were members of the Freedom Fighters had appeared back in the Golden Age. They were all uh, property of the Quality Comics line, which was later bought by DC Comics. But they didn't... They had not appeared as a team. The, the, the Freedom Fighters, you know, was kind of one of those retro continuity type things. Although this was... And, and this original story was written by Len Wein. It, it was not a, a Roy Thomas thing, although Roy Thomas would put his imprint on this series later on. So the first appearances were in 1973 in those two issues of Justice League of America, issues 107 and 108, and those have been reprinted. And I, I do have both of those. I pulled them out and took a look through. Then in 1976, from 76 to 78, they had their own series called Freedom Fighters, or The Freedom Fighters, which ran for 15 issues. Although, I, I, and I have some of those. I think I have the first eight issues. I didn't pull those out and look through them. But there is no explanation of whether the quality heroes were always on Earth-X or what the story was. Because they weren't, I guess they didn't have a common history with with the other DC Comics characters like the members of the Justice Society from the Golden Age, even though they had been published at the same time. And so at this point, there was no explanation. It, it seems like those characters were all of Earth-X. That was the quality Earth. And uh, also, I should mention that there was a couple other characters that were also from published by Quality, and those were Plastic Man and also the Blackhawks. All of those characters were originally published by Quality Comics. And so they, even Plastic Man and, and the Blackhawks kind of made a, a brief appearance in a flashback in those two issues of Justice League of America. But it wasn't until All-Star Squadron issues 31 to 35 that it was explained how the characters who were members of the Freedom Fighters, and I suppose I should name them, Uncle Sam, Black Condor, Doll Man, Human Bomb, Phantom Lady, and The Ray came to be on Earth-X. And at that point it was explained that they were originally on Earth-2, but 
Uncle Sam using some power that he had to bridge between worlds pulled them over to Earth X. And I, actually, it was also revealed in that story, and this is something which was new, which had not been revealed before, was that they weren't the first team of freedom fighters. And the uh, Uncle Sam had actually recruited another team of heroes to be the freedom fighters, and they had more or less gotten wiped out. And that's why he had come back to get more heroes. And anyway, I think I, I have read the original appearance in the Justice League of America, and I've read those first eight issues, although it's been a long time since I've read them. And uh, but the the issues thirty one to thirty five, I think, is a really cool story, and uh, it, it's it's really worth uh, if you're interested at all in this stuff. It's really worth a read. And uh, and that's about all I've got on updating as far as as the freedom fighters go. Wolverine, Venom, Claws, and Webs. This is a story that ran in Marvel Comics Presents numbers 117 through 122. I believe all these issues were released in 1993, so a little over 20 years ago. As I record this, I guess 21 years ago. I read this because it's the art is by Sam Keith. He also did another story that I read, which was, I believe, called Blood Hungry. And, I, and I've also read some other stuff that Sam Keith has done. I've, I've read uh, at least one or two of the Batman stories that he's done in, in the past ten years or so. And I've also I've read the entire run of the Max. I have all the trades of that. Maybe one day I'll reread that and record commentary on that. And so I, so it's really on the strength of Sam Keith's, uh, on the strength of the previous Wolverine story and the strength of, of Sam Keith's artwork that, that I bought this and read this. And I've got to say, I wasn't really impressed by it. The first, the other story, Blood Hungry, which I talked about in a previous episode, I think it was episode 35 of Dave Talks Comics. I really liked that one, and I'd read that one before. I'd read that one about 10 years ago, maybe more than that, I'm not sure. And then I read it earlier this year, in 2014, and I really liked it both times. It, It was very imaginative. There was a lot of different elements going on in it, and this one... I, I just didn't feel it. Now that one was written by Peter David, and I've liked some a lot of Peter David's comic book writing. I've even read a few of his Star Trek novels and enjoyed those. But this was not written by Peter David. This is written by Howard Mackey, and as I said, it, it pales in comparison to to Blood Hungry, this Claws and Webs. So basically, it starts off with it takes place in a dream world. And it starts off with Wolverine fighting Venom. And this is a a six-part story. The previous one, I think, was an eight-part story. I'm not sure if it would make a difference if this was longer because it it felt a little too long to begin with. I think it's only, let's see, two, four, six, eight. Yeah, I guess so. it's, what, 50 pages, 48 pages, something like that. I mean, the art is beautiful in this, and I, I really like the way Sam Keith draws Wolverine, and even the way he draws Venom. I'm not really a big Venom guy. I've never really read very much in the way of Venom stories, so I can't really... I, I know of the character. I know it has something to do with the black costume that Spider-Man wore, starting, which started in Marvel Superhero Secret Wars back in the mid-1980s, but... I really don't know that much about Venom. So they're in this dream world, excuse me, and Professor X makes a a small appearance in here, and basically it starts off with them fighting, but then they start teaming up because they both realize they're being manipulated by Nightmare, 
who I think was originally a Doctor Strange foe, a foe of Doctor Strange's. I'm not sure. And uh, I think, as I said, it's it's written by Howard Mackey, and this is the second story by Howard Mackey that I've read, and neither one has really blown me away. The other one was Gambit, which I talked about on episode 48 of Dave Talks Comics. So I'm really not sure I have anything else to say about this story. Uh, like I said, Wolverine and Venom fight. That's the, the beginning of the story. Then they team up to take down Nightmare. There's no other real characters in this story. And it it kind of feels like the writer had just like a couple plot points. And after that, he kind of just threw that at at Sam Keith and said, well, why don't you make this write a story where they're, where Wolverine and Venom are fighting, and then... I, I mean, I, I have no idea how they collaborated on this, because it's really not apparent. So, it was a little frustrating reading this. I mean, I really... I went through it a lot faster than I wanted to. There wasn't as much depth. There was a lot more big panels. I think there were some small panels in the other Wolverine story that I read that Sam Keith drew in Blood Hungry. Um... And the art's beautiful, but I, I had trouble connecting with it because I didn't feel that the underlying story had, there was a lot to it. There wasn't much to it, to the characters, and I don't know. Uh, in fact, the only other thing worth mentioning is that the Marvel Comics Presents, of course, was an anthology book. At this point, they normally had four stories. They had four different stories going in each. Some were just one shot, some were ongoing. In issue 121, which is the next to last issue that, that this story ran in, there was another X-Men related story, uh, which was called Faith and Fable, of Faith and Fable, which starred Danny Moonstar and a Valkyrie named Mist. And I guess the most, I, I mean, it caught my eye, honestly, because Honestly, because of the um, the art, you know, which is very sexy, by Joe Madureira. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Joe Mad, I think it's usually what people refer to him as. But uh, it, it's an okay story, and it kind of covers a period of the X Men that I am unfamiliar with. I, I knew that the X Men had some involvement with the Asgardians, but at this point. Danny Moonstar, who was a Native American Cheyenne, is it, I think? She has become, has joined the the Norse gods, or these the Valkyrie, she's become a Valkyrie, and, and this Cheyenne god, or maybe it's a demigod, comes after her to take her home, and so there's a bit of a fight there, and she refuses to go, and anyway... It really didn't give me enough of a taste to want to read more, and I guess it was more the uh, the artwork that caught my eye. Um, but uh, anyway, Wolverine and Venom, Claws and Webs, I can't recommend this. I mean, other than for the art. I mean, the art is, is very nice, and there's a couple of the covers which are kind of cool, and there's some splash pages which are kind of neat, but there really isn't much of a story there to hold it together. And I've probably rambled on longer than I should have, and I should probably find something else to talk about right now. But that's it for Wolverine and Venom, Claws and Webs by Sam Keith and Howard Mackey. Young Justice Failsafe. This is episode 16 of season 1 of Young Justice. And I know it's been a while. Actually, it probably hasn't been that long in terms of episodes of Dave Talks Comics since I talked about Young Justice. But there's been quite a break in... There's been a number of episodes of Young Justice that I've watched that I haven't talked about. And originally I wanted to be talking about the cartoons I watched every week so that I have something, even if it was only a couple minutes on each episode, but I, I haven't been very successful at that. So uh, this is what I've got, and this is what uh, you get if you're listening. Anyway, this episode, 
I really enjoyed. I enjoyed it the first time, and I really enjoyed it this time. And it's kind of operates a little outside the box. I think it's it's a very intense episode. You the episode basically opens with the Justice League getting wiped out one by one. It doesn't all happen at once, but uh, there's these alien invaders coming down, and the Justice League is is taking them on. You basically see them get most of them get vaporized. And basically it gets down to the point where then Young Justice, the, t- the members of Young Justice, are the only ones left who have to take on the invaders. You know, Robin, Miss Martian, Superboy, Kid Flash, Artemis, and somebody, I'm forgetting somebody, aren't I? I'm not sure. Probably am. Uh, oh, Aqualad. Yes, Aqualad. Their leader. <laughs> Um, but I, I really love this episode and part of it is because it seems like it crosses a line because you see all these characters getting killed or, you know, seemingly getting killed. It seems like something's not right here. You know, they, they, this obviously can't be happening. They, they can't be all be getting killed, you know, but you don't know exactly what it is. I mean, is this a dream? Is this... Uh, is this a case where there's going to be some magic reset button and things are going to get reset? Or, uh, you know, what's the catch, you know? Because they can't really be killing off all these people. And I, I obviously, this was the second time I'd watched it. The first time was a, a year or two ago. And I, I think I enjoyed it just as much. And I didn't remember, exa- I remembered more or less what it was, but I didn't remember exactly what it was. And there's actually a twist in it. I mean, it's more than just that it isn't all really happening. There's there's something to it that caused things to go down exactly the way they go down. And so there's a bit of a reveal there. And, uh, well, okay, I've got some other some other comments on this episode. Uh, the... The alien spaceships reminded me a little of the ones from the three-part story that opened the first season of Justice League. And I think they don't look exactly like those, but there's something similar there. And, I mean, it's also similar in that you've got an alien invasion story. And I don't remember if they ever revealed exactly who the aliens were in that, that episode. I've seen it at least a couple times. And I don't think it's called the pilot. I think it's called invasion or something like that. But... And uh, the other thing was this this episode made me think of a few other episodes. Uh, it made me think of, there's an episode of Super Friends from Challenge of the Super Friends called History of Doom. And Challenge of the Super Friends was when, was the season, I think it was just one season long, where they would always set it up as the, the, the Super Friends versus the Legion of Doom. And the Legion of Doom was kind of like their opposite, you know, it was Lex Luthor. And I don't think the Joker was in there. But it was like Lex Luthor and Sinestro and Gorilla Grodd and Giganta and Toy Man and Black Manta and, uh, okay, I can't remember all of them. Uh, Captain Cold, I believe, was in there. And there, there, was, there, there was basically one of them for each member of the Justice League or, or the Super Friends, as they were called in that cartoon. And... This episode was right near the end of that season, and basically what it's it set up was that it 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 began with these travelers coming from another planet or another universe or world or galaxy to Earth, and Earth had been devastated. It was you know it was post apocalyptic. The the Hall of they arrive and they land at the Hall of Justice, and the Hall of Justice is in ruins, and they find some tapes which show what happened. And so they play the tapes. And so basically you get to watch with them what happened. And basically the, the, the Legion of Doom did something and it set up this whole scenario, which resulted in the destruction of the earth. And that no matter what, the, what the super friends tried to do, they couldn't stop them. And it, it didn't just result. I mean, the, I think the Legion of Doom wanted to take over the earth, but of course it results in the destruction of the earth. And so what happens in the end is these three people or beings, or whatever they are, they look like humans, or they look humanoid, do something to turn time back and 
change things so that they don't happen the way they did, kind of give things a second chance. But once again, I mean, I saw that when I was probably nine or 10 or eight, nine, 10, some, somewhere in there. I think it first aired in 1978 or somewhere in there. And, it, you know, it was, it was a different episode, just like this was a different episode. It was something that you didn't see it because usually Super Friends was just, you know, good guys versus bad guys, you know. And sometimes they threw in some weird twists, and but uh, but nothing like that. I mean, that was just completely different. Uh, the, the okay. So the, another thing that I wanted to talk about was that what really makes this episode work is the voice act is the voice actress who plays Miss Martian, who I believe is Danica McKellar, and her reactions to her distress when she sees what happens to her friends, to to the Martian Manhunter, her uncle, to her teammates getting killed. And at, at one point they think, well, actually, no, wait, it's possible they're not, they haven't been killed. They've only been, it, it's a teleportation ray and it's, it's, they're actually in the, in the mothership. And so they, they go to attack the mothership and then they, it doesn't look like that's the case. It looks like they really are dead. And, uh, but she just really sells it in, in, a, in a couple instances where uh, it, it just it, it's just so good. Her, her, her distress really seems real. And it's it's not just that she, she does it so well. It's just that you don't get that level of intensity, I don't think, on shows like this very often. That it, it just – it's – it it just seemed very very real, you know, and 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 I guess it was it was at a level you you don't even get from that character, you know, because you get a character like Superboy, and Superboy gets these very intense emotions and very visceral reactions to things, and violent reactions to things, and it kind of becomes commonplace. But she's always kind of level headed, and for the most part, very level headed character, and so to see her break down like this. Uh, and of course, in the end, it turns out that she's the key to everything that's happening. And I, I won't say anything more than that. But her her distress, her intense emotional reaction to what's happening, uh, also, when I was writing up my notes, made me think of a, a story of All-Star Squadron, which, was, which, which I talked about on Dave Talks Comics Actually, it was Dave Talks Comics and Cartoons at that point. It was episode eight. And it's the one where it's from All-Star Squadron issues 19 and 20, where the All-Star Squadron goes up against the brainwave. And they they find out that the brainwave has, has already captured the, the Justice Society. And so they take on the brainwave and they get captured, and then the brainwave is ready to kill them all, and then the Green Lantern shows up, Alan Scott, and he sees what's happened, and he he doesn't realize they're still alive, he thinks they're all dead, and he goes ballistic. And it was that kind of level of emotion that I got from from Miss Martian in this episode, when she, when she, when she um, really thinks that her friends have been killed, her and uh anyway this was a really great episode it's it's uh it's an it's an intense one i think even if you know that it's not real you still got to wonder okay when are they going to turn the corner when is this going to happen and i think that's one of the most interesting things about these superhero shows because you know that they're not going to kill off these characters and yes in the comic books they do sometimes kill characters off although quite often they end up coming back but Still, you, you know they're not going to kill them. So the question, what, what keeps it interesting and what can keep it interesting is how are they going to get out of this situation? How is it going to change them? How are things going to proceed from here, you know, once everything's resolved? And I think that's what makes an, an episode like this interesting, you know. And I think they keep it very interesting. And uh, and this episode does have consequences, even though nobody actually is killed in the end. Spoilers. But it, it still has consequences. And it's part of why I like, I really like the first season of Young Justice. And I only say the first season because I haven't watched the second season yet. I'm still waiting for it to, to come up on Netflix. I mean, uh, 
Uh, just like I'm still waiting for season three of Adventure Time to show up on Netflix. So I may end up having to buy these. But that's... So, so that's episode 16. And at this point, I'm going to take a break from Young Justice. I think I have... I think there was 20... Two or twenty-four, maybe even twenty-six episodes in this season. But I'm going to take a break from Young Justice, and I'm going to go back and watch the second season of JLU next. Uh, so that be episodes, well, the fourteenth to the twenty-sixth episode of JLU, and then I'll come back to Young Justice. So anyway, that's it for episode sixteen, fail safe of Young Justice. That's it for episode 52 of Dave Talks Comics. Uh, questions or comments can be, well, I'd say post them at either davetalkscomics.com or go to facebook.com slash davetalkscomics. And, of course, you can always email me, davetalkscomics at gmail.com, or you can tweet at davetalkscomics. Next time on Dave Talks Comics, I am going to be returning to Alpha Flight. I'm going to be talking about issues 5 through 8 of Alpha Flight. Uh, So that's about it for this episode. I'm Dave. Thank you for listening.